The picture you see is a guitar that I made by hand. I bought the majority of the hardware, like the tuners and the bridge, but I made the rest of it starting with chunks of wood and cutting and shaping it. All of the carving of the body and the neck I did by hand. This is actually the first guitar that I ever made. When I built it 12 years ago, I didn't even play guitar. In fact, I don't think I had ever even held a guitar in my hands until I had this one built. I want to make the best sounding guitar. How can I produce the best sound if what is de deemed to be best is so subjective and highly dependent on the individual human interpretation? Well, we all know that some guitars are universally thought to sound great and some just sound bad. So which is it? Is there a good sound, sound pattern that can be recognized or is it just going to come down to individual subjectivity? I have found that these two apparently conflicting notions can actually coexist, just as technology and art mutually coexist and complement one another. I began sharing my findings by giving presentations at universities. I found that the engineering students became excited by the use of math and science to engineer something as cool as an electric guitar. In the end, I find inspiring others through my endeavors to be the most rewarding part of my guitar experience. And I have reached the same conclusion in my professional career. It is the human experience of sharing, mentoring, and making discoveries with my fellow engineers that I find to be the most rewarding aspect of engineering. So this is my motivation. I just want to share some of my discoveries about the subject that I'm so passionate about. I have a doctorate in mechanical engineering from MIT. My major was fluid and thermal sciences, and I'm really a fluid and thermal guy. I consider that first and foremost my, my deepest background, but I'm also a precision engineer. I have particular experience in precision machine design, fluid bearings, and vibration. I have 20 years of industrial experience, engineering systems like cryocoolers for space satellites and computer controlled machine tools that make components for things that you use in your everyday life. Today, I work for Corning Incorporated, where we produce the glass in your TVs, glass in your smartphones, and ceramic substrates that reduce emissions from your vehicles and make the air we all breathe a little cleaner. Have you ever heard Eric Clapton play Crossroads and had chills go down your back? Eric Clapton remade a blues classic first recorded by the great Robert Johnson, and he electrified it using this device, the electric guitar. The electric guitar is a wonder of technology that was engineered in the 20th century. Metal strings mounted on a vibrationally wonderful wooden structure are passed through a magnetic field and an electric current is induced through a coil of wires and output to an amplifier and to a speaker to produce a sound that is rich in tone and can be used to produce music to enrich our brains. Inspired by the technology and art meeting at this crossroads, I began building electric guitars, carving them from solid chunks of wood about 12 years ago. Why did I start building these? It's a, this is a hobby for me. I'm not really trying to make this into a business. It takes me too long to build these and I can't really make any money at it. I love working with my hands. I love building things. I love engineering and I love art. This is a great combination of those things. It all started when a friend of mine who is a guitar player told me that the type of wood used in electric guitar can affect its sound output. I disagreed not knowing any better at the time. And I said, I bet that the sound is all on the electronic side of the system. He said no, that he knew for a fact that how a guitar is constructed can affect the sound. At that point, I was hooked. I had to build these. This idea that the structural vibration of the guitar could affect the resulting sound output, I wanted to build one and find out. I have built guitars for some noted players, Johnny Paris of Stereopticon, Felicia Collins of The Late Show with David Letterman, this is the really fun part of having built guitars. Great players making music with them. Beautiful guitar, Felicia. The gorgeous. What a beautiful, the honey of a guitar. 
What is an electric guitar? It's a wooden structural member with six steel strings pulled into tension. The strings vibrate and make a sound. You can hear the sound of an electric guitar, even if it isn't plugged in. It's just very quiet. How does the guitar convert string vibration to an electrical signal? Shown on the guitar are three components called pickups. They have copper wire wound around a magnetic pole piece, six pole pieces, each one for each string. The pole pieces create magnetic fields which emanate outward through the strings. As the guitar string, which is ferrous, moves through the magnetic field, by Faraday's law of induction, an electric current is induced in the copper wire. It's really that simple. You could look at the pickup as a sensor that is used to measure the vibration of the guitar string. We're going to discuss the mechanical design and vibration of the instrument here today, but there's a whole science and art to the design of the pickup itself. Okay, we have six strings. What frequencies or what notes are we going to need to generate with this guitar? Here I've tabulate, tabulated six strings, E through E, and they're open first mode natural frequencies. By open, I mean I haven't placed my hand on the neck. I just hit a string and cause it to vibrate. It vibrates at its natural frequency. So the open frequencies range from 82 hertz to 330 hertz. Using this simple formula here, I can calculate the string tension needed to achieve those frequencies. For example, a guitar string takes about 20 pounds of tension to achieve its frequency, and the total string force for an electric guitar is about 100 pounds. If you place your fingers on the strings and clamp them to these metal strips called frets, you change the vibratory length of the string, thereby causing the string vibration frequency to change, and therefore the note that it's playing to change. That's how we play all of the notes of the guitar. In all total, a guitar in standard tuning with 24 frets produces note frequencies ranging from 82 hertz to 13, 19 hertz, all in standard tuning. What else do we need to know if we are going to build an electric guitar? How about the basic dimensions of the guitar? Well, it turns out we don't have to figure any of that out because it has already been figured out for us, basically. The vast majority of electric guitars are all very similar dimensionally. They may look different at first glance, but in reality, they're all very similar. Their design has evolved over the years, many, many years, to yield what is maybe the most ergonomically human-friendly and cool-sounding instrument. That's why they are so similar. If you tried to build a guitar far outside these dimensions, players would complain. Guitars do differ in these little ways. Thickness and feel of the neck, how big it is in your hand. We're talking actually very small differences in the neck geometry that can feel completely different in your hand. The number of cutaways, Eric plays a Strat at the top, which has two cutaways. Jimmy Page plays a Les Paul with a single cutaway. But functionally, the two guitars are very similar and dimensionally, they're very similar. Guitars vary in wood type and pickup choices, but functionally and dimensionally, the guitars on the market are all quite similar. So we decide to design a guitar. How should we do that? Well, I'm an engineer, so I use CAD. I laid it all out, determined what I wanted it to look like and what the dimensions were before I even started to build the first one. I incorporated all the previous information I showed you on the size of the body and the neck into my CAD model. I also designed something that I thought was aesthetically pleasing to me. I didn't venture too far from a traditional look because frankly, I liked a traditional look and I wanted most guitar players to like my designs. The majority of electric guitars are made of wood and these are the types of woods that are generally used. And because I wanted to actually engineer my guitar, I wanted to know the engineering properties of these different woods. This is a huge challenge. Unfortunately, data available for mechanical properties of wood leaves a lot to be desired. You go to different sources, you get different values for things like modulus of elasticity. There's a reason for that. The properties vary from species to species, from tree to tree, even within a single board. The properties are also directional, depending on the direction of the wood grain orientation. So you see that the wood grain pattern depends on where it, where it was in the tree that it was cut out of. Generally speaking, as an engineering material, wood is very soft and flexible. 
It has a modulus of elasticity, you can see much less than even aluminum, which is one of our more, more flexible common engineering materials. I decided that if that I wanted to engineer my guitar, I would need to measure the properties of the specific board that I was going to build my guitar from. For example, here I'm using a simple bend test to measure its modulus of elasticity. I simply place a weight in the middle of a small beam and measure the deflection of the wood. The resulting modulus of elasticity is nearly twice that you would find in the literature. I'm using select woods with very uniform grain structure and it doesn't surprise me that the properties of the woods that I'm using are actually much better than those of the general material property databases. Once we have a handle on our material properties, we can begin to analyze the guitar. Before we build it, we want to analyze it. This is a finite element model that I generated of the guitar assembly. There's different material properties for the body, the neck, the fingerboard. I've also used some equivalent effective material properties for the truss rod that runs down the center of the neck to account for its stiffening effect on the neck and also on the weight distribution. The first thing I want to do with this model is to analyze the effect of the string tension forces. Based on the string dimensions and the frequencies that we talked about earlier, I can calculate that there's about 100 pounds of pulling force between the headstock and the body. I distribute those forces on the tuners and I calculate the downward force exerted on the strings onto this member here called the nut. And it's about 18 pounds of downward force. Here in the bottom two pictures, I'm showing the computed static deflection of the guitar when it's loaded with the string forces. The headstock actually deflects outward by about 30 thousandths of an inch, which creates about seven to eight thousandths of an inch of neck relief when there's no truss rod adjustment made. This compares well with measure, measurements of the actual guitar deflection. Next, let's look at the computed stresses in the wood resulting from the string forces. This guitar, I'm getting about 650 PSI of tensile stress on the back of the neck near the headstock, and that's kind of scary. If I look up in the literature, the tensile strength for hard maple is about 720 PSI. But as I just mentioned, I can't believe the material property database anyway. Still, it's a concern that the back of the neck is so heavily stressed, right? What if in addition to string forces, the musician accidentally bumps the headstock into something while he's playing or, or, um, or swings around and hits something? We'd better pay attention to this issue. What can we do about it? We orient the wood grain as is shown in that top right picture. This is quarter sawn wood with vertically oriented grains to give us the maximum possible strength. Shown in the second picture is a is a called a volute. It's something that I made on another guitar. It's added material right to the part of the neck that endures the highest stresses. Volutes are good. I like them. The last picture is not my guitar, the one in the lower right. This is a different guitar made by a well-known guitar manufacturer, and you can see that it has broken exactly where you would expect it to break based on this analysis. This is actually a common thing to happen in this particular model of guitar, particularly. You can see pictures of them all over the internet where this has occurred. You can go into music stores and see where some of them have been glued back together in this exact location where this break is shown in this picture. Let's look further at the stresses in another area of concern, the joint between the neck and the body. This is actually a critical area of concern. The strings are pulling the neck forward trying to separate this joint. I'm computing about 265 PSI of tensile stresses trying to separate these two surfaces. Let's say that I want to use a bolt-on neck. I don't want to rely on a glue joint. I know from my precision engineering design principles that if I want the neck and the body to behave from a vibration perspective as essentially one structural member, then I don't want any vibrational energy in this joint to be lost. I therefore need good compressive stress in this joint, no tensile stress. So I designed into my neck joint these series of bolts and steel threaded inserts. I've actually built into my neck the steel threaded inserts that help, help to spread the compressive stress from the bolts. If I'm using a quarter inch diameter bolts torqued to 25 inch pounds, I compute the force per bolt to be around, around 500 pounds each. 
and there's four of them, so that's 2,000 pounds. Almost one ton of clamping force. My clamped area is 5.1 square inches, so my joint contact pressure is 390 PSI on average. So on average, my 390 PSI exceeds the 265 PSI of expected compressive stress that I calculated. So on average, it should be okay, but how can I be sure? I create a more detailed finite element model shown in the next slide. Please find part two of this video.